All right, we're going to get started. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our second episode in Healthy Hardy Heifers, a uh, virtual series for managing heifers post weaning to calving. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about transition after weaning, one of the most important times in a heifer's life. And so today we're going to be listening to Lindsay Ferlito and Casey Havocus. They are both with Cornell Cooperative Extensions. Um, North Country Regional Ag Team. So in a minute, we'll get them started, but we're gonna first uh, walk you through what all of our uh, series uh, is. Last week, we heard from Morello Carvalho from Holstein Canada, and we will be posting the link to that um, recording uh, for people that missed it. So stay tuned for that. Um, today is transition after weeding, and we will be meeting every other Friday from now until November 19th and all of these topics. So we can't wait to join you for the other weeks, but first we've got today's topic. So um, we have to give a big shout out to our sponsors. Uh, thank you to them, Diamond V, Arm & Hammer, Pool and & Grain, and Zen Pro. Um, thankfully for them, we're able to put on this uh, webinar series free of charge. So thank you so much to our sponsors. And so without any further ado, we are going to kick it off. And I think I'm going to pass the mic to Casey Havocus first. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Betsy. So for those of you that um, don't know me or weren't on last week, my name is Casey Havocus. I am one of the dairy management specialists on Cornell Cooperative Extension's North Country Regional Ag Team. And I'm going to kick off today's session by talking a little bit about nutrition right after those calves are weaned. So once um, she's weaned off of milk, and those first couple of weeks after that is really that, and first couple of um, months after that is the time point that Lindsay and I are going to be covering in today's session. So we know that raising heifers is a huge part of a dairy farm's operating costs, up to 25% actually. And of that 25%, about 50 of that is related to nutrition. So we really wanna make sure that we're getting that right because it's a huge cost associated with raising our heifers. And I also want to point out that I think it's easy to sometimes think that once she's weaned off of milk, the hard part's over. Um, I think a lot of people focus a lot on that um, pre-weaning phase when they're on that milk diet and putting a lot of focus and care into that. But I would argue that it's equally important in those weeks and months following the weaning period for um, producers to focus on nutrition and make sure that their calves are really getting off to um, a good start after they wean. So the overall goal for dairy producers is to have healthy heifers that achieve optimal growth to calve between 22 and 24 months. And in order to achieve this goal, we need to make sure they're reaching puberty in a timely fashion. So we wanna make sure that we're getting our heifers bred between 12 and 14 months, or when we base it off of body weight, around 770 to 880 pounds. And one of the reasons that nutrition remains very important during this post weaning period is because memory development occurs at a faster rate than any other organ during this time period. And it's going to be heavily impacted by what she eats. So in order to make sure that she's going to have optimal milk production once she freshens and enters the lactating herd, we need to make sure that we're feeding her right during that um, time leading up to puberty and breeding. So after weaning, the goal is for heifer development to continue with the objective of achieving high rates of protein and muscle gain and low rates of fat gain. And the target or the average daily gain that you're going to target is, of course, going to be dependent on your farm's individual target age at first calving. And you can kind of work backwards and do that math based on how many days you have until breeding, based on what you're feeding and based on what your target age at first calving is. But overall, the general recommendation for average daily gain for Holstein heifers from birth until breeding is about two pounds per day or about 0.9 kilos per day. And I also wanna point out here that at this point in time in the pre-puberty stage, you can still feed heifers a high plane of nutrition because they're going to be putting it towards skeletal growth rather than fat deposition. So you're able to you know, feed them those high plans of nutrition without risking them getting too fat during that time period. But of course, that's within moderation. 
Um, so having said that, if you're going to be feeding them excessive levels of energy, it can have some negative impacts such as decreased epithel epithelial cell proliferation, increased deposition of adipose tissue in the mammary gland, and lower milk production later in life as a result of that. But on the flip side, if you're not feeding her enough energy or nutrients, it can lead to poor growth, delayed puberty, which is going to delay your breeding, which is going to delay your age at first calving, and that's just going to have an overall negative economic consequence on her future performance in your herd. So getting that nutrition right is really critical during this time. So what can we do to achieve that average daily gain of about two pounds per day? Well, at weaning, the calves should be eating solid feed, of course, right? Once they're weaned off of milk, or you're not going to be weaning them off of milk if they're not eating solid feed, hopefully. So at this point in time, solid feed should be accounting for 85% of their dry matter intake. And I recognize that the solid feed is likely going to be in the form of a starter or concentrate, which is usually a high feed cost. So the tendency or the, the desire to start introducing uh, fermented feeds or different forages is kind of um, is kind of high at this point in time, but it's really important that you recognize that rumen development is still occurring at this time. It's increasing in size and increasing in microbial populations. So this is actually not the time to be introducing fermented feeds. Their rumen is not developed to the point that they can handle it. They're not going to be able to utilize the nutrients effectively, and you could be doing more harm than good. So Really, you want to make sure that you're holding off on introducing those fermented feeds until a little bit later in life. And the recommendation for um, introducing fermented feeds, so thank you, Matt, for asking that question. I would say the very minimum is three to four months old, but you might even want to delay that until six months old. So as the rumen size increases, they can slowly start to to consume a higher forage diet with those fermented feeds, and you can slowly start to incorporate these fermented and foraged fiber ingredients into, a, into the diet. But when you do introduce these ingredients, you want to introduce them in a way that reduces sorting. And I think I'll touch on that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, related to the feeding management side of things, you want to make sure that you're pushing up feed frequently and keeping it in front of the calves to reduce, or the heifer, sorry, to reduce slug feeding. So you want to encourage um, even meals throughout the day, and you don't want to get them in the habit of eating as much as they as much as they possibly can all at once. And that becomes especially important once you start introducing some of those um, fermented feeds because it might depress their rumen pH and uh, you wanna to try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, and then also you, um, it's important to remember that it takes time for the rumen to adapt to change. So you wanna to try to go as slow as possible in order to maximize success and stress associated with these dietary changes. So uh, the recommendation is to introduce these different feed ingredients over a two to four week period and slowly start taking the concentrate out. So you don't wanna do it all at once. Um, that's going to be another stress that's associated with this already stressful time. And it's going to promote better rumen health if you go slow and allow that calf to um, naturally adapt to those changes. And the other point I wanted to make um, related to sorting is that sorting is a learned behavior. So as soon as, or as early as you can try to um, avoid that behavior or eliminate that behavior, the better. The sooner that she learns how to sort, then she's just going to be at risk of carrying that behavior over as she transitions through life and as she transitions onto some of those more rapidly fermentable diets that she's going to be at increased risk of, of experiencing acidosis. So more related to some of the management um, that we can take on for these pre-puberty heifers. So we wanna make sure that we are weighing heifers and taking body condition score measurements often. So I recognize that weighing heifers isn't always that easy once they get older. I mean, when they're the size that they are in this picture, it's kind of easy to throw them on a scale, but um, I recognize and understand that it gets a little bit harder as they get bigger, it gets harder to handle them but taking body condition scores is a really easy thing that we can be doing. And it's a really insightful number and value to be looking at. So the recommendation is to be taking weights and body condition scores at birth, 
weaning, pre-breeding, breeding, pregnancy confirmation, and calving. And Betsy's going to touch on this more next week in her presentation. Um, but I guess the, the last thing I want to say on this note is that it sounds like a lot of time points to be taking body condition scores, but it's really not that time consuming and it's not invasive. It's not going to bother the heifers at all. Um, and it, it's just really impactful information to have so that you can make changes to your program if needed. And then also related to feeding management, we want to maximize the likelihood that heifers are consuming a diet that's intended for them. So we want to reduce competition at the feed bunk. We want to limit the stocking density, ensure adequate bunk space, and again, reduce sorting so that um, they don't learn that behavior at an early phase of life. And I'm going to pass it over to Lindsay now. Lindsay is going to get into some of these um, housing and behavioral considerations that I just Perfect. Thanks, Case. Um, so, yeah, like Casey said, I'm going to talk uh, more about the behavioral aspects of this period, um, as well as how we're housing this animal. Um, so just put up those pictures there just to get us thinking about what we're asking this animal um, now that she's weaned. Uh, like Casey said, we kind of think like, yay, we've got her weaned. She's good to go. Um, and then we move her into this new facility. Um, so Casey, do you want to start clicking on those? So one of the biggest things that's going to change is how we've grouped them. Uh, a lot of farms in New York are still housing calves individually, and now we're going to jump to a group setting. Uh, we're also going to see changes in ventilation. Uh, maybe we're going from a natural system to a mechanical system or uh, a mechanical system to a natural system. We're also going to see changes in the type of housing. So it's just different whether she's coming from a hutch to a barn or from a certain type of barn to a different barn. We're also going to see changes potentially um, in the feed bunk design. So how she's accessed her feed before, maybe she just had her own individual feeder. Now she has to go up and navigate um, multiple spaces at a feeder in a group setting. She's also potentially going to be exposed to a different type of bedding. So again, um, just another type of stimulus in the pen, another thing for her to adapt to. And then finally, um, obviously, like Casey just mentioned, we're going to have a change in our diet. So all these things are happening at the same time when we move these um, young calves into a new heifer barn. Um, and then, like Casey said, we just kind of expect them to go. And so it's not really surprising that on a lot of farms, we actually do see setbacks in that first or second um, transition heifer pen. And as we were putting these, these slides together, I think it kind of is, is another example of, we talk a lot about, joke around with producers a lot about how, you know, oh, everyone forgets about heifers and they always, you know, they're always in the barn at the back and we kind of forget about them. But I think it, it is true kind of as an industry as a whole, if you go into the literature and try to pull information, if you look at calves, we can, you know, get down to very specific details. If you look at lactating cows, we get down to very specific details. And then when we start talking about heifers, it's all, oh, give her enough space, give her enough this, make sure it's this. And it's very little um, scientific data on this group of animals. So I do think, yeah, as an industry, there's a lot we can learn about um, this group. Because as we learned from Marilla last week, every stage of her life is important and everything we do to her from birth on is going to impact her as an adult cow. So what more can we be doing to manage this transition better? So next slide, Case. So just some of the behavioral considerations. Ideally, since we're doing such a huge change from um, weaning, getting her out of that calf barn into the heifer barn, we want to make sure she's adjusted to weaning. So it's usually recommended to give her about a week from when we've um, started withholding milk to fully adjust um, to a new diet, make sure she's consuming enough, drinking enough water before we add an additional stressor to her. Uh, and like I mentioned, there's gonna be impacts of new, new grouping. So keep that in mind too. What are we asking of this calf? Is she going from an individual hutch to a group of 20 animals? Obviously that's gonna be a huge adjustment. She now has to navigate that pen. She has so social interactions that she's never had before. Um, and these are very social animals. So something just to consider when we're looking at even our calf barn design is how can we better house our calves to help them be more successful through this transition. And we are seeing a lot more data coming out now about the benefits of pair housed or group housed, um, but a lot of work on the pair housed because that's a little bit more feasible on most farms. Um, the benefits of having that early social interaction and how that then uh, creates a heifer that is a little bit more confident when she enters these group settings and she's more successful at uh, identifying where the feed is, where the water is and navigating those social interactions. So to help with this, we wanna try to keep the, that first post wean group small. 
Um, so a lot of the a lot of the literature suggests six to ten animals because we don't want to be taking uh, this calf from an individual setting and throwing her into a massive group right away. So let's start with um, smaller groups of six to n six to ten animals. Um, that also helps us in addition to reducing the social stress, kind of keeps them um, consistent in their body size. So it'll help limit some of that uh, competition at the feeder like Casey was talking about. And we can feed them the dietary needs specific to that group. So we're not having ranges in that group of you know months in age, we're looking more like weeks of age. Um, next. So looking specifically at some housing consideration, um, ideally the first step would be that this these transition heifers are in a different barn than our milk calves um, for a few different reasons. That way um, we can focus on each group of animals in their own barn. It helps reduce um, transmission of pathogens and we can um, tailor our management to those specific animals. Some of the common post weaned heifer housing that we see in New York uh, includes super hutches. So that's the picture up on the top um, or small bedded packs where like you said, we can have these groups of like six or 10 and they're entering into a pack and they've got space to move around. And then we've got multiple pens kind of side by side and they move on up as they get bigger. At this stage of age, free stalls are not recommended uh, for a few different reasons. Um, mainly these girls just aren't gonna know how to use them. Um, they're not gonna be using them properly. It's gonna be harder to maintain that bedding. They need a good amount of bedding. Um, these are small animals. They don't have that extra body heat from ruminating the same way that our, our larger animals do. So these calves do need a good bedded space. Um, it's also nice to give them, like you can see in that bottom picture, the chance to kind of snuggle um, and have that social interaction. And so we've got to make sure that we're giving these girls at least 35 to 40 square feet of bedded space per heifer. So that doesn't include alley space, that's just the space that we're providing bedding. Next slide. Looking specifically at the feed and water space, um, this is where you can see there is a little bit of a range depending on where you look and depending on whether we're talking about animals that were just weaned or a little bit older. But we're looking at this age group of having about a foot to a foot and a half of bunk space per heifer. Um, similar to not wanting to have free stalls, we also don't want to introduce headlocks at this age. But what we do want to do is get these girls ready for headlocks so we can introduce um, these slanted feeding spaces. So you can see that in the picture there where she gets used to having to put her head through something. And she potentially has already had to do this in a calf pen, depending on how um, you offered feed in the calf pen. But it shouldn't be that different from how she's accessed feed before, potentially. So it's kind of an easy transition. Um, we also want to make sure we're providing adequate water, um, two to three inches per heifer. And we want to make sure that waters are low enough that the smallest heifers can reach them. Um, so if you have a group setting and you've got bigger animals, we need to be catering to the smaller animal in that group and make sure that we're monitoring these groups to ensure that they actually are adjusting to the new system, that everyone is figuring out where the water is and where the grain is. And I included this picture. Um, Betsy and I had just done a farm visit a few weeks ago, and uh, I thought this was a great example of how it is possible to keep heifer feed bunks and water nice and shiny clean. So let's do also do a good job of making sure that that is um, an enjoyable experience for them and that when they go up to that water, they're getting clean, fresh water, or clean, fresh grain. Next. Um, and one of the last things I want to touch on is ventilation. So again, we, we talk about ventilation a lot in calf barns now, I feel like, which is great. Um, but I think from some of our work with farms, one of the biggest areas of opportunity for a lot of farms in this first transition heifer pen is ventilation. A lot of times, um, rightfully so, we're trying to utilize older facilities and it seems like a good idea to put some of these younger, maybe more adaptable animals in them. Um, but a lot of times we forget that maybe these systems still need a little bit of tweaking and we need to make sure we're getting adequate ventilation to these animals. So we're still looking for, similar to a calf, uh, four to six air exchanges per hour in the winter. So that means every hour, the entire air volume of the barn needs to be changed four to six times. And then in the summer, that increases to 40 to 60 times. So about once a minute, we want the entire volume of the barn to be changed over with fresh air so that we're removing any dust, any pathogens, um, any odors, gases, um, and bringing in fresh air for these animals. And this can be done in a few different ways. Uh, we've seen, uh, again, similar to calf barns, we've seen heifer barns that have tubes, positive pressure tubes, like you can see in this picture having uh, a natural ventilated system where you've got higher sidewall curtains and you're relying on some natural breezes. And then we can also see mechanical ventilation. So either a tunnel ventilated or a cross ventilated situation. And obviously this is gonna depend, you know, which option you choose on a few different things. Cost is a big one. Um, the mechanical ventilated systems 
are, um, you know, a little bit more uh, consistent in what they can deliver in terms of air exchanges because we're not relying on breeze, but it's more upfront cost. Uh, we have more fans, we have more maintenance, um, more electricity. Um, so basically it comes down to the feasibility and what the farm is willing to, to pay and, and manage. Um, and just a note too on the maintenance, another thing, um, the, one of the biggest things I feel like with ventilation too that we've been discussing is maintaining those systems. So regardless of what barn we're talking about, if you have a ventilation system in place, uh, please remember to regularly clean the fans, check the system, just make sure it's doing what it was designed to do so that we're, we're getting uh, the most out of that system. Next. So I just wanted to end with um, a little bit of local data for anybody um, from New York that's joining us. This was a project that Betsy, myself, and another colleague did over the past two years. It was funded by New York Farm Viability Institute, and we looked at 15 farms across uh, Northwest New York, South Central New York, and Northern New York. And it was for a project looking at um, assessing different parts of a uh, dairy facility and trying to identify areas of opportunity and areas of excellence and providing producers with feedback on how they were doing and kind of give them a benchmark based on these other 15, 15 farms. Um, it was pretty representative of New York herds. 14 of them were free stall. We had one tie stall. Uh, one was a robot. Average herd size was about 580 far, or 580 cows, ranging from um, 50 to over 1,000. So like I said, pretty representative of New York as a whole. Um, and what we did was we looked at that first weaned heifer pen. So that's that um, column there that's called first weaned pen. And then we also did either the next pen, so the second pen after that, or a, a heifer pen that was identified as a trouble pen for that farm. Um, but it would at least be older heifers because the first wean pen would obviously be the first group of transition. So we looked at things like nesting score and we can see for the most part, uh, farms are doing a pretty good job uh, providing bedding. So that's good to see. Um, and then if they were in a stall, we then did bedding amount. Um, we looked at stall base hardness. So uh, not surprising, uh, we did see some herds that uh, weren't scoring as high on this just because of probably using mattresses that probably are old and need replacing. Uh, we also looked at bedding cleanliness to check to see if these heifers are getting cleaned out. And it was nice to see that um, in a lot of cases they were. Uh, maybe what is one of the bigger areas of opportunity is bedded space per heifer. So especially for that first transition pen, we are giving half of the recommended amount of space on these farms. So that's a huge area of opportunity. Um, either we need to you know, build another barn, add more space, uh, have the discussion about how many heifers we're supposed to be raising uh, and go back to you know that question of are we raising the right amount of heifers for our facility and for what our operation needs um, and then we looked at stocking density if they were using stalls which most of them were not most of them are using a bedded pack and then feed bunk space and water space and thankfully for those two all the farms um, or on average the farms were meeting the industry targets so that was nice to see but this was just I thought a good example of kind of where we're at in New York and because there's not a ton of published data on kind of heifer benchmarks, um, just wanted to give a glimpse. And it kind of, I think, reaffirmed what we already felt in extension working with these farms is that, yeah, one of the biggest areas is that bedded space. Um, it's easy to kind of just sneak in a couple more heifers or we have a slug of calves and um, throughout the year, we might get overcrowded a little bit. So just keeping in mind that we still wanna be giving these girls enough space um, so that they can continue to be successful. Next slide. And I think this is my last slide. So again, just a reminder of everything that we're asking this animal to do in this short period of time um, when she's young and she's not had a ton of experiences. Um, so just trying to set her up to success. What are the things that we can do to make this transition easier on her and therefore make her more successful? And I think that's it. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much, Lindsay and Casey. Um, I think you guys did a really good job giving an overview here. Um, what I'd like to do is invite our people listening to put your questions into the chat. Um, Casey and Lindsay are happy to take some questions. Uh, Casey, go to the next slide. Um, I just want to call to attention next week's topic quickly while we're waiting for some questions to come in. Uh, next week, you'll be hearing from myself and Lindsay on pre-breeding comfort and nutrition. Um, and you can see the rest of the ones coming in. So I think we have some questions coming in. I'm going to open up my chat real quick. All right. So 
I'm going to go up to the beginning question. Um, all right. So if you are dealing with a calf for which you know nothing of background parentage, except for breed, perhaps, um, how can some of these things be addressed? I think that we talked about in episode one, is that the question? I think Lindsay, maybe you wanted to answer that. Um, I just thought maybe we could have a discussion. So I, yeah. and maybe I'm wrong, but so basically you're, I think we're talking about if you have a calf, which you don't really know their potential maybe, um, or even, I guess you could argue too, maybe you, maybe even a situation where if you're bringing animals into your herd or bringing animals back from a calf raiser or something, so maybe you don't have a full history on this animal, how can we kind of manage that and consider that moving forward? Um, I think we just work off of, I don't know, and I, ladies, I'm curious to see what you think, um, work off kind of like a best case scenario and hope that we can still still just manage her like we think she can um think she's got the potential that your other animals do um and manage her that way I don't I don't know if I have any more specifics yeah Casey you want to toss anything in there yeah I think um some of Morello's points last week were very much focused on you know what happens to the mother impacts the calf but I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that environment also plays a huge role. So even if we don't know what we're working with, how we manage the environment that she is now going to be raised in, I think can be just as important, if not even maybe more important. I don't know that I could specifically definitively say it's more important, but I think just a hunch is you can have the best genetic cow in the herd, but if her environment isn't up to standard, she's not going to perform to her potential, right? So um, working with the environment that you have and making sure the environment you provide her with is adequate, I think is really where you need to focus your efforts if you know nothing about her. Yeah, I'd agree with that because I remember Morello talking about the same calf, whether it's moved to Alaska or Florida, she's going to, it's going to look very different in those two situations. So yeah, I think what we, what environment we provide her with, as long as we're doing the right things for her and the environment she's in, we're gonna positively impact how she uh, performs for us. So, um, next question, I think it's more to do with nutrition, Casey. Uh, the length of cut, does that matter at all in heifers who do not have time budgets like lactating cows? For example, long stem dry hay and baleage, do they work okay nutritionally? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So, hmm, okay, so sorting's learned, right? So if they learn it, so some research that was done by Dr. Emily Miller Cushion and Dr. Trevor DeVries' lab group saw that if calves learn how to sort prior to a dietary change, in this case, it's weaning, or prior to a stressful life event, and in this case, it's weaning, they're going to be more likely to carry that behavior over after they transition onto a new diet or after they transition through that phase of life. So for calves, you know, that's not the end of the world. They're not going to be experiencing acidosis. They're not going to be at huge risk of metabolic or rumen health issues once they transition onto um, that, that new diet. However, it does become an issue once we get into situations like transitioning from the dry period to lactation. And I saw some of that in my master's work that cows did carry over that behavior once they transitioned from one diet to the next. So that's a long winded lengthy answer to say that I think minimizing the opportunity to sort is really important. And if you're incorporating dry hay into like a, into like a concentrate, chop it really well so that they can't learn to pick and choose. But if you're feeding like a baleage or just like long forage, then like obviously you're working with what you have, but if you're going to incorporate it into some type of a mix, I think it is important to try to minimize the chop length and chop it as much as you can to try to minimize that. Um, Betsy, do you have, or Lindsay, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll challenge that. Um... While they don't have a limited time budget, they still have a time budget, right? They still have to have enough sleep and enough time to eat. Um, 
And so it looks different from a cow, lactating cow time budget, but they still have a time budget. Um, and so things like overcrowding can definitely impact the time that she has to eat. Um, and if they're overcrowded um, and feed doesn't get pushed up, what does she have left to eat? You know, the leftovers from the, the other um, more bossier heifers that, that didn't eat. Um, so I'm gonna wanna do the same things you talk about, Casey, and just like take into account um, what are we making her conform to? Um, so we can provide a great diet as long as it's the same diet from midnight to midnight. Cool. But if it changes throughout the day, um, let's make sure that we're providing the right, um, the right system for her. Uh, next question. I think Lindsay, maybe this one will go to you. Winter housing. What temperatures can calves withstand an open housing, an open housing environment? For example, calf houses. Um, so we're talking like milk calves, or do we think we're talking? Maybe Mike, if you're still on, do you want to just pop that in? Um, I'll start, I guess, explaining, and then we'll see if I'm answering your question. So if we're talking about milk calves, um, so we do see. Um, I guess also true to the definition of an open housing environment, because um, I guess you could argue a hutch is kind of an open housing environment. Um, Wien calves, oh, Jersey heifers, oh, Jerseys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so wean calves. So, um, you know, we talk about calves have like milk calves, like when they're first born, having a much different thermal neutral zone um, and really not doing well below temperatures of 50. Um, once she's, you know, one to two months, in case you correct me if I'm wrong, um, once she's past that like two months of age, she's weaned, um, her thermal neutral zone changes quite a bit and she can handle temperatures down to freezing. Um, that being said, we don't want everything that we're putting into her to go into maintaining um, or just maintaining her, you know, keeping her warm and maintaining her. We want her to be growing. So if we are putting these animals outside in an open shelter, which we do see um, up here in, in Northern New York when it gets pretty chilly, um, we do see weaned heifers outside we do need to offer um, adequate bedding that is clean and dry. Um, she needs to have shelter. Um, so she'd have to have a three-sided shelter at least that would provide her uh, shelter from the winds. We wanna make sure that it's blocking her from our prevailing winter winds, uh, that we're providing her um, enough nutrition to maintain that and access to clean water that's not freezing. Um, so ladies, if you disagree, but I'd say we, we definitely do see it and it can be successful, but it's the same with the calves, like being outside, you can't just put a Jersey calf outside in a hutch and, and she's going to be okay. We have to be giving adequate bedding. Um, if we're talking calves, you know, jackets, extra feedings of milk. So basically the same idea is carried over to heifers, clean, dry environment, out of the wind, enough space, um, you know, group housing so she can snuggle and then adequate nutrition um, for ma maintenance and growth. So yeah, I guess my answer is very cold. <laughs> very cold. I think the key to that is the adequate dry bedding. We forget about these heifers a lot of times. And if they don't have that, we need to feed a lot more energy to those calves in order to keep them growing in the winter time. That doesn't always happen. So yeah, I like your answer, Lindsay. Um, next question I see is, uh, what's the proper age, at uh, age to transition to stalls after a pack, especially in the winter? Um, most, so when you look at, um, like most recommendations, they want her to be at least 400 pounds. So give or take at least six months old. Um, so, you know, nothing before that. Um, and actually if you look at like university of Wisconsin and stuff that puts out a lot of the freestyle dimension recommendations, they don't offer anything for less than that. Um, so looking at it at least 400 pounds or six months old, um, <clears throat> but maybe a little bit older if you really wanted her to, um, um, to be, yeah, to just be a bit bigger. And again, you know, a lot of times we see those heifers being put on a mattress with no bedding. She will not be warm enough at six months old on a mattress with no bedding in the winter. Um, so I think just that recognition too of it, it's hard to keep a lot of bedding on most mattresses. Um, so uh, we got to make sure that if we're putting those younger heifers into a free stall system, that we are managing them appropriately and giving them adequate bedding and keeping those stalls clean and dry. Um, sand, yeah, sand is, um, Matt, I think Gary, were you from central New York? Um, yeah, sand can work, uh, again, assuming we're, we're managing it. So we do get sand freezing up here in Northern New York in the winter. So if, if there is enough moisture and it's on, and, you know, an outside row of the barn, 
and your sand is freezing, then no, that's not going to be keeping, you know, a little six month heifer really warm. Um, but we can do things to manage that, um, raking the sand, um, you know, um, making sure those heifers are appropriately sized. So we're not getting really messy stalls and adding extra moisture to those stalls, which could then add to freezing. Um, but we do see heifers in sand at that age. Um, it just takes that recognition that we got to make sure they're, you know, doing okay in the winter. Great. Well, I think that answers all the questions in the chat. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to uh, reach out to any one of us um, and we will see you next week for pre-breeding comfort and nutrition.